Welcome everyone to the Lost World Museum. My name is John Adolfi and this is my lovely assistant Kristen and we're happy to be here this morning. We are going to take questions as we move forward here so we're going to encourage you to share what uh, may be on your mind and so we're going to talk about Peru. We were there last was it 2000, 2021. No, 2021. Yep. And let's take you first to Cusco. This is where the 12 angled stone, 12 sided stone, 12 angled stone is located. Now, let me grab it. Oh, yeah, that. Well, yeah, you can do that, but let me just show you an artist's rendering of that. This right this this is the stone wall is right in the heart of the town. It was a fortress at one time. And only some of it is left. Pretty much all four sides, but it's not as tall. They're all megalithic stones, which means that they're absolutely huge. And good morning, good money. <laughs> Del says good, good morning, Del. And so there is this one stone there, and Kristen's going to show you something in just a second that is very cool. This is what it looks like. And the angles go up, up like this. You see the angles in the sides? Okay. So if you count those angles, there's 12 of them. Now, the size of this is five feet by four feet. We asked them, how much does it weigh? And they had said six tons. Six tons, which um, in, uh, in pounds, that's around 12,000 pounds. This is a 12,000 pound stone, and it's about up in the air about what? About three feet? I mean, the top of it is, you know, about five feet up. It's only about, about a foot or so off the bottom. About a foot or so off the bottom. And it's got, that's right, it's got some smaller stones yeah. supporting it. Now, what's unique about this is the fact that it is large and it's heavy and it's complex. You would think that they would just what? They would just have regular square yeah. stones. I mean, if, if you were trying to use... Um, uh, sand and you were trying to like there's different methods that we know that they used around the world to smooth stones and you can smooth a stone by putting sand down and, and you know and, and grading it back and forth the easiest thing to do is to create you know four straight sides because you could use that method if you have to chip it with stone and you're talking about creating a stone with that many angles and again it's seven feet deep how do you get it so that it per perfectly fits up against all those other stones? Here it is. So this, we had a replica done of the 12 angled stone. And the amazing thing, and again, for those of you just joining us, it's five feet across and four feet high. And the, people say, well, what's the big deal? Folks, it's seven feet deep. That means all those cuts, and they're not claiming it's cuts. They're claiming that it's pounded, crushed that they made all these beautiful angles that you couldn't even get a, a piece of paper between the connecting rocks. Seven so, feet deep, 12,000 pounds. And this is in Cusco, Peru. So how many times would you have to keep lifting this up or lifting the other rocks up in order to, like, okay, we're off about three feet back. We're off several millimeters. I'm How many Several times? millimeters? <laughs> no, not even a millimeter. Let me tell you. Well, I mean, it, when you're first, no, I know, you're I know. first trying to get it But done. when they refined, however they did this, when they got done with it, they allowed me several hundred years later, whenever this was constructed, to come in and just basically test how wide the, uh, the, the, uh, the seams were between the stones. I brought this to Peru specifically to measure it. Is this the one that I brought? Yeah, it's point zero zero three six if you can see it point zero zero three six inches or nine hundredths of a millimeter this is nine there we go nine hundredths of a millimeter look how thin that is yeah it bends that's that's how thin of a metal it is so i went up to the rocks and i put it in there and i went across and I couldn't even penetrate it a millimeter. And as I went across those seams, it would not fit in there. It would just glide across nine hundredths of a millimeter and I couldn't get it in. 
By the way, if you have any questions, you feel free. Yeah, to free, free. Them. This is we're going to be uh, you know answering questions and comments. We'll recognize you, especially those that what do they call it? Super chats or super whatever. You guys go ahead and do your thing. But that's what we used. Now, obviously, there are some rocks that are separated a little bit. There are places where you could get, you know, a knife in or a piece of metal or something like that. But in general, they're all still cl so close together that there are times when you can't, you'll lose sight of the edge of the the, the, the seam of the rock. It Literally, there were places where I couldn't tell where the... As if they're invisible, as if the rocks were, were one rock. I tell you, if you ever take the chance, take the time, take the money, go to Peru and look at it for yourself. It's one of the coolest places you will ever travel to. Now, Juan Gomez just said they must have used some sort of laser. It looks like it's laser. We suspect that they used stone softening, that they had a method to do that. Stone softening would make, would make some sense of it, of being able to butt up against these. Like, for instance, people have done experiments with bags of cement, little bags of cement in plastic, plastic bags, and they shove them all together. Uh, it's not done vertically. It's done, you know, on a walkway. And then they just take the bags away, and the stones are very close together, like tied up, you know? That's one possibility. The other possibility is that they actually cut them. They didn't use... Tell them, tell them when we asked the guides there uh, what tools they used to construct this well it, it varied but in general like the the tour guides that are standing around the cusco palace they'll show you pictures of um they looked like round stones that were shiny and he said that they were 70 percent metal now i don't know like i don't know much about that how you can get a stone that is 70 percent metal i don't know if they found it like that or they made something like that but they will show you that and say that they used a combination of things that they would chip with, and then also that round one never did figure out how that all worked. But right. there are other um, guides, uh, like in Oyante Tambo, that specifically told us, no, there was a, a previous megalithic culture, previous to the Inca, that was worldwide, and, and they had some kind of technology. And they and he showed me, in fact, cuts um, on the stones in Oyante Tambo. Now, here's the really interesting thing. Uh, you're very welcome, David. Here's the really interesting thing. When you do megalithic studies, you're going to see a couple of things. Number one, that they're mo the most ancient of uh, structures uh, in any particular area. That's okay, Walt. Well, glad you're here. And the other thing is, is that they're old looking, and they're large, and they fit together really well. And a lot of the times they look like a, a puzzle with little keys and stuff, you know, different, different sizes um, and multifaceted. You'll see that not just in one place in Peru, but throughout the world. The other thing that you hear is that it was a previous culture, or let's see what uh, James has to say. They want, they cut probably logical method given the result we witnessed today. You're right, yeah, that exactly. does, it does make the most sense. Also, because there was a friend of ours that he lives in Mexico and he said, no, no, it was the, um, it was, uh, it was Joe from the Mount Blanco Museum. We have a museum owner friend. He was the one, I think, that was telling us that there was um, stones that he was told that they, well, he saw the, a bird um, making a hole in a, in a rock, and they, he asked about how the, it was doing it, and the, and the local said, well, it gets a leaf off this local tree, and, it, and it, it puts it on the rock, and it keeps pecking at it, and it softens the combination of apparently the saliva from the bird's mouth, I, I guess, and that particular leaf made a hole in it. So did did the Inca or whoever previous to that know that? Did they have, did they gather that leaf, make some kind of solution? Right. Because when you look at the stones, you'll you'll see these scoop marks. It looks literally looks like somebody had uh, the surface of the rock soft and they took a, like a shovel type thing. You know, often they were about this wide, the scoop marks, and they would it, it apparently just scoop right down the side. Otherwise, there makes no sense to, oh, there's comments we just missed. Um, Thanks, Perk. There's, otherwise, there's no reason to, I'm like, if you were chipping it, why would you keep going, you know, in farther and, and out farther here? Like, it makes no sense to make that kind of a shape. It does. It looks like somebody was, was sculpting with sheetrock or sculpting with mud <clears throat> and or cement and with all these scoop marks. That's another thing you're going to notice on the megaliths is look for scoop marks. You're also going to see those nubs. You see them randomly, it seems. They're not on all of them. That's what's most confusing. I mean, there's one or two uh, nubs at the bottom of many of the rocks, but a lot of rocks have none. 
occasionally you'd, you'd even find three. Well, it's so random though, what were they used for? There's more, there's more questions than answers. Good morning, Eileen. And just to sit there and say, oh, you know, the indigenous people did it and uh, don't you try to take away anything from these people, we're not. Um, if you go to Peru and ask them, they'll tell you. Now there is this national pride with all these uh, and, these ruins and, and everything. So. Absolutely. They have a beautiful culture. And, and a lot of that was done by the Inca, uh, the Inca trail and a lot of the construction. But the megalithic structures, those things which are the oldest and the, usually on the bottom of these structures are absolutely mind-blowingly large and technically intricate and difficult. So, And there are, there are some guides that would, you know, would tell us that aliens were involved. So, you yeah. know, you get a variety. So aliens, megalithic uh, previous culture worldwide, or Inca. So you get a variety of... Now, where I was getting at, let's see, could, um, oh, we didn't the, see the that comment, up there. Sorry, the comments disappear. I don't know where you can see them. To... Um, so <laughs> Oops, the, uh, the other theory, and you'll see this uh, mentioned around the world, from Stonehenge to Baalbek to Peru, is that giant humans were involved. Now, there's a private museum in, uh, in, in um, Peru. They don't identify where it is. I'm going to show you. This is a magazine called if Ancient... We... If we go back, we're going to try to hunt up a couple of these places. Ancient America, okay? Ancient America. And in here, they have this museum and the headdresses and the skull that they have there apparently is supposedly to a very large individual. They didn't do a lot of um, measuring. Having been there and seen myself, I'm convinced that. All right. Um, but this right here is a coat made out of or a, or a, a some sort of coat or or cape made out of gold and it is to around an eight not excuse me a nine foot man um they said they wouldn't drag something like that on the ground and the thing itself is somewhere around eight feet so they drape this over their shoulders and then the head went up about a little over nine feet they say that giant humans were involved in the construction of the megalithic structures. When we've done our research, giants typically, when they're genetically produced, not pituitary gland type giants. That are weak and frail. Which are weak and frail, which we see many evidences of that today. But there are a few evidences, such as Angus McGaskell. Oh, yeah. That, he's one of my favorites. And the uh, what is the Greek uh, or the Roman? Oh, Placinius. Placinius saw. He wasn't big himself, right? Uh, he was the explorer. Right. Yeah. The, the, he saw the, the tomb. Um, oh, get the, get Ajax. the, I'm going to show you something I haven't Which shown yet. You? Get the, uh, the kneecap. It's right over there. So Placinius went to the tomb of Ajax. Now I haven't done a video on this yet, but I'm going to show it to you anyways. And they saw a kneecap of a giant this big. Uh, huh, huh. <laughs> his guide showed it to them it was a it was a tomb to, um well there's multiple oh i can see if i can read this fast enough yeah they say gilgamesh was large too and i wouldn't be surprised because the closer you get to the worldwide flood and i wouldn't be surprised if noah was a good 11 12 feet tall we'll know that when we get on board noah's ark and we take a look at the built-in furniture friends yeah, there's all kinds of um, historians that talk about, you know, giants in the Golden Age. Yes, David, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> they used machines, a small remnant of humans had tech back then. Yeah, it's, we think so too. We think it's tech. We think it's intelligence, increased intelligence that we don't have quite like they did back then among the common people and strength because of size. So our personal idea is that when the Bible says in the pre-flood world that we were um, living 900 years, we were probably a lot taller. There's so many of the plants and animals in the fossil record that were a lot bigger than they are. So a genetically strong, tall, extremely intelligent race of people post-flood. Um, 
<laughs> Thank you very much, Perk. It's hard to read everything. Yeah, it, go ahead. So, yeah. Anyway, and then post flood, you know, we were dumbing down in size. You see the ages uh, go, going post flood rapidly downward over the first five generations. They're dropping rather quickly. So you would have enough time for, you know, giants and, and that golden age of, you know, Greek heroes and, and things where Greek gods and stuff. And that's why you'd find some of these tombs. You might even have technology, you know, the the, the pyramids or, or other things being done post-flood before right. we lost all that. All right. Listen, we're going to wrap this up. And uh, why don't you grab the yellow thing right There's there? Another comment. Yep. One of the last. Yes. Extremely tall or giants. Yes. And you talk to this, the Native Americans. Just grab anyone. Peruvian, welcome. Hey, we Franco. love your country and I love your food. You guys have the best food oh, ever. Oh, she does. She really does. Oh my goodness. There's a special a, ra a restaurant, Noyante Tambo. I would eat there today if I could. I love the structures there. I absolutely love them. The people are are awesome and they're robust. Listen, they may not be six foot two, you know, people that generally speaking, uh, the people there. But one man who was probably five foot six, he grabbed my suitcase small suitcase, put it up on it, carried it when we had to go to this one megalithic site for like a mile or two. And I'm like on, puffing and puffing. And we were I at know, what, 10,000 feet? 11,000 feet. 11, feet. That guy's just lugging suitcases around. Of course they made the Inca Trail. Of course they made, you know, large portions of Machu Picchu. It's the portions that, that, that completely baffle us as the megalithic ones, the huge stones. So... Don't be fooled. The camera makes me probably look better than I really ah, am. Look, I know you can't. I know you can't read this backwards, but it says museum alerts. <laughs> no museum alerts. This is where you're gonna get alerted when we go live. So there you go. And you get a free report about the three top reasons why Noah's Ark must still exist. Museumalerts.com. It'll be in the uh, comments section after we get done publishing Do you have this. any questions about the Megalis or Peru before we go? Yep. Again, I recommend go to Peru. It's the easiest place to travel. You don't even have to be able to hike all over. You can drive right up or, or like in a bus right up to the ruins. Yep. It's, it's just really easy to... It travel. is. It's not bad. It does help if you do know Spanish. It does help a little bit. So, all right. This is John and Kristen Adolfi signing off for now from the Lost World Museum, where we asked a provocative and important question. Where did we come from? Apes, aliens, or Adam? You guys take care.